The history. I had been running the Dark Tangent system. That was the name of my bulletin board systems. The bulletin board was known around the world. We were on international FIDO networks. And when one of those networks called PlatinumNet out of Canada was going away, he was shutting it down. I was the biggest node. I had the most users and I distributed to the United States. And he wanted to throw a party, going away party for all of his PlatinumNet users. But he didn't want to do it in Canada, and all of his users were in the States. And so we were talking, he says, like, well, you should do it. You know, we should work together. And I said, great, let's do it in Vegas. And that makes the most sense, cheap airfare. And he said, sounds good. And I mean, this happened over the course of less than a week. It was really brief. And then all of a sudden, he disappeared, PlatinumNet went down. And all these years, 20 years later, I've never heard from the guy again. I can't even remember his name, it's been so long. So when that disappeared, I had already started planning to do this going away party for PlatinumNet. So instead I invited all my networks and it went from being a going away party to a party. There was like HoHoCon, there was an XCon, there was a PumpCon, SummerCon, but there was no, no real West Coast Con. So we figured, okay, so it ended up being DEF CON. You know, the first one, there was a flyer that went out and that kind of circulated around on some of the sites. And, and I think that's how I came across it initially. I'm assuming it was because of a book I wrote or maybe my congressional testimony. I don't know. But somehow he had contacted me to come out and speak. I actually didn't want to go to the first DEF CON. I did not want to go to the first DEF CON. A number of my friends were going. They were trying to get me to go. They kept telling me it was going to be fun. And I kept thinking to myself, I'd never been to Las Vegas before. And, you know, I used to go to BBS user meets and, well, a lot of them are pretty lame. And I thought to myself, okay, this is just going to be a BBS user meet in Vegas. Contacted me somehow, said, you want to come out to Vegas? And I said, well, I don't like Vegas. Come out and speak. And there's a bunch of people, Phil Zimmerman and a couple of folks. And DEF CON won. And I had a blast. I had so much fun. It felt that we were part of something that was really kind of legitimized because um, because there was this event around it. You know, it wasn't just you know random people that you might have known or heard, or it wasn't you know somebody on the uh, you know in the phone freak world. It wasn't somebody on the end of a toll free loop around that you know you you called at midnight and hey who's there you know. So I ended up meeting a lot of people, some of whom I'm still friends with to this day. Um, out of all of that, and I remember after the first DEF CON was over and I was back home and I was decompressing and somebody wrote me on UUCP in my email, wrote me an email and said, hey, that was great. When are you doing it again? And until I'd gotten that email, I'd never thought of doing it again. And then I thought, you know, I could probably make this better. I could change this, I could, and then that started it. That was all game over from there. It was every year 
what can I make better? What went wrong? How do I fix it? And that geek sort of fix it mentality kicks in and you're always are trying to improve it. So it's sort of like this challenge you'll never solve, but you keep wanting to make it better. If people missed a few years, their differences between their experiences is going to be pretty radically different. DEF CON 1 was um, around 100 people, and um, we expect roughly 15,000 uh, for DEF CON 20. We just, we, we work nonstop. I haven't seen 4th of July in, in like seven years. It, it's crazy that DEF CON, as, as you can label it as a hobby, takes so much time uh, because it seems like pretty much from the moment DEF CON ends until the time that we're spinning it up again, we're busy. You know, technically I retired two years ago, um, but I can't give it up because it's such a part of me. I'm giving back to the same culture that spawned me. DEF CON for the last 10 years especially has been a very big part of my life. It consumes most of my free time. DEF CON starts for me the day after DEF CON is over for the next year. It's going to be amazing. It, we have so many surprises planned for the attendees. It's going to be remarkable. Um, this is going to be a really, really special year. If you're sleeping, you're doing it wrong. A lot of people who are hardcore DEF CON attendees or staff, they negotiate when they change jobs. That's fine, everything's good, but I need to take, you know, two weeks off. I never thought that my party would be a job employment <laughs> prerequisite. I am not kidding. I am expecting another well-orchestrated, well-oiled machine coming together and producing this amazing gathering of geeks. No kidding. It's what we do. We come together and we do the hell out of it. And I expect it to happen this year. There's absolutely a difference in between driving and flying. When uh, Utah Group, for example, used to go down to DEF CON, uh, years and years and years ago, there was a whole process where basically we gathered at this restaurant called D's, or like we called it Freaky D's, at like 2 a.m. And uh, basically, you know, 20, 30 of us pile into the restaurant and we'd have our caravan of cars all set together. And that was our, just our group of people. There are some hijinks that I can't even imagine mentioning on a documentary that uh, that can happen on a, a long nine-hour drive from uh, the Denver area to uh, Las Vegas. When you're driving, you, you know, to get there, especially from the West Coast, you have to drive through the middle of fucking nowhere. <laughs> and it, it certainly adds to the experience when you roll in and it's just after sunrise or it's just about sunset or you really have no idea what time it is and there's Sin City and of course you're playing Viva Las Vegas by the Dead Kennedys or something like that and it, it does add to the experience I think. kind of blows my mind that everyone's so excited about going to a barbecue six miles away from the con that they have to rent a taxi for or go to the grocery store and get food for. I don't know, I just feel like the, the barbecue is this misfit love child of uh, DEF CON because everyone's like, hey, it's, there's this thing that happens over there and they're grilling alligator and elk and all this crazy meat and why, why can't we ever go, where is it? And that kind of adds to the mystery and the fun of it. Man, did, uh, did 
Did I never expect that to become something that's like a thousand people strong now? To me, that shows like an awesome community spirit and effort of, hey, I want to see my friends and I want to hang out with them and I want to, you know, just do something simple like let's let's eat some food. You know, it's it's not at the con. There's no crazy music. It's just a barbecue. Ever since I was in town around DEF CON 10, 11, you, know, you see those signs in the airport, come shoot a machine gun, which, you know, it's fine for me, I've, I've done, but a lot of my friends said, man, I'd love to do that. Well, I said, let's just go out in the desert, I'm sure we can find a nice group rate, and we'll, we'll shoot out in the sand pit. And everyone had a blast, and they said, boy, are you going to do this? This was great, you're going to do this again? So now there's just this well-known public shooting spot way out on the Lovell Canyon Road outside of the city where anyone can go, anyone can shoot what they want as long as they police up the area, and we use it. And it's, it's again, much like DEF CON itself. You keep getting popular and growing. Now we have canopies and tables rented that I arrange. There's a small per head fee just to cover that. We had 100 people on the line last year. We've got damn near that many registered this year. We're gonna stay safe and see what we can make happen. Can everyone hear me over the reports over the burp? Yes. Yeah. All right. All firearms are always what? Loaded. They are always loaded. Nothing is ever an unloaded firearm. You always point the firearm where? Safe direction. In a safe direction. Yes, the key point, not just being your target, but what is beyond it. The, the hacker community you can never put a single hat on anybody, but there's a, there's a libertarian undercurrent to a lot of our membership. So being able to just treat guns as, well, that's this piece of equipment. If you use it the right way, it's great. It, it percolates through most minds. So you get the occasional raised eyebrow, but half the time that's the person who's like, I'm gonna go see exactly what you think is so fun. And they're out there shooting a cannon or a, an automatic rifle. And they say, boy, I, I get this. I think it was the, the year when I was at the Aladdin and we'd forgotten to uh, um, sort of clean up our room or we didn't think that the maid was going to show up as early as they did and uh, you know we'd gone off to breakfast and we came back and the maid had been in the room and cleaned the room and organized all of the drugs <laughs> so there's like a little pile of acid and a little pile of ecstasy and some other pills <laughs> and it was they're all nice neat little piles and I was like huh <laughs> well I guess things are different in Las Vegas You've got to put the convention in a 24-hour city. You know, it's got to be like a New York or a Vegas or maybe a San Francisco because hackers get bored and there's got to be something for them to do. And, uh, and I saw what happened when there's a lot of bored hackers running around. You know, a lot of activities uh, in the computer underground would happen after midnight. Uh, that's just the way it is. So, you know, the fact that uh, people can move around and not be like, not be noticed as much being uh, a group moving around at midnight, that kind of added to the, the appeal. And I'm big on, on privacy. Nevada still respects people's personal privacy. You know, your hotel room is considered your domicile. It sounded fun. Just a bunch of computer people, right? I mean, it just seemed like my group was, was in Vegas and it sounded like a really, really fun time. So, and it, you know, the whole underworld connotation of it all was very attractive to me. So I feel like there's going to be a streamline of people, like, really dedicated, like, we're going to be first in line, we're going to be first in line. I want to make sure I get a badge. Like, that was my biggest, it was my first DEF CON, and I just, I want to make sure I walk away with a badge. We're all DEF CON virgins. we got to pop that DEF CON cherry yeah. and sort of get those badges. Um, and how many hours do you have to go before you get your badge? Well, it's nine hours now. Yes, we drink. Good. What are we drinking? Stop recording, please. We got pizza. Pizza is good.
Yeah. Alright. The jet lag is sunk in. Looks like he's using a pizza box for a Pella. We will not abandon our posts. This is my first DEF CON badge. Now what made you decide you were going to come to DEF CON? Um, my husband's work decided to send him and I started going through all of the uh, videos that they had for DEF CON 19. And I started looking at that and going, ooh, this is really cool. 20th DEF CON, been wanting to do it for years and uh, it was just one of those things that just sort of lined up, all the, all the moons lined up perfectly. Uh, definitely heard a lot about the con. It's a, it's somewhat affordable con, and there's lots of technical discussions. A whole bunch of really smart people that probably know more than I do. Most of them. So I hope to learn something. You know, the opportunity to hang out with those people that really know what's going on was, you know, too enticing to, to miss out on. And I thought this would be an amazing place to just meet and really intelligent people. So now I'm here, and I'm really excited. Uh, to meet a lot of interesting people and learn a lot, have a lot of fun at once. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, a big congregation where people uh, that pretty much live anonymously online get to actually um, socialize in person and kind of uh, not have to worry about as much, you know, revealing their identity. Well, I've read all kinds of dire warnings about using any th anything here that's potentially hackable and nearly anything's hackable, so... I was told to take the battery out of my phone. Just. <laughs> You know, I've got a checklist sort of in my mind. You know, kilt, colored hair, drinking before 10 a.m. I haven't seen quite just yet. Every single device in the world has some kind of computer in it and they all have vulnerabilities in one way or another and this is an information of what those vulnerabilities could be and how to fix them and make them better and improve it for the future. Are you the teacher? Yes. You are the teacher. And this is your first DEF CON. Yes. And you thought to take a pack of neophyte students into Las Vegas to go to a hacking conference. Yes. Yes. Do you have tenure? Rule number one, follow the three, two, one rule daily. And please bear in mind these are minimums. At a minimum, three hours of sleep, two meals, one shower. By tomorrow afternoon, the pungent and stank aroma of many DEF CON attendees will waft through the air and hit you like a Mack truck. So remember, you plus deodorant equals everybody wins. I, like many people here, will not remember your real name. There are lots of Steves, Jeffs, Chris's, and Bills, but only one, maybe two, with your unique handle. Hopefully you've picked a good and unique handle to avoid conflicts in the namespace. Create a good handle for yourself before someone creates it for you. So I've got questions. Who here is from other countries? Wow. That's impressive. Thank you for coming all the way to join us, you guys. That's awesome that you came out. DEF CON is truly an event and a conference where you get out what you put into it. DEF CON is the one time a year 
where everything that we do year-round actually becomes physical. All these people that you've met in IRC, all these people you've been chatting to, all these people you've been reading their research, following their work, looking at the different things they're publishing, they're here. Walk up to them, tell them that you like their work, buy them a beer. They'll probably be your best friend. It's one of the biggest things about this crowd you've got to really swallow is the fact that we are all super, super approachable. You can be a wallflower here and still get a lot out of it, but you're not going to get you 200 bucks worth, frankly. You're going to have to interact, work with people, get to know people, go party with people. If you don't know something, be proud of that. Be like, I don't know this. Can you please teach me? Can you please educate me and train me? This crowd loves spinning people up. Take the time to go in and learn from these people. They're geniuses, truly geniuses, and some of the best in the world in whatever it is that they're presenting or working with. So take advantage of it, you guys, okay? All right, the next rule is one that uh, basically says, the media is not your friend. Don't trust them. <laughs>DEF CON looks like this big amorphous jellyfish of people everywhere, but what I hadn't realized is that there's really a lot of stuff that goes on the back end to keep it running like clockwork. That's what makes DEF CON so exciting. It's super organic is the way I see it. If you're inflexible, it doesn't work with DEF CON because there's too many people and you'll just break and that's just the reality of it. I always joke that for me, it's an opportunity to spend four days out of the year not caring about computers or computer security. Everybody's Christmas, New Year's, birthday, anniversary wrapped up into one for hackers. It's an experience that's not like anything that anybody has described because it's kind of something you can make what you want out of it. Like you can show up and you can just go to talks and you can sit there and get that out of the conference. Or you can show up and just party. You can show up and hang out in your hotel room with a bunch of friends. When it comes down to it, like you're the driver of the experience. It's not a pony show where you can just, you know, sit down in a seat and let it unfold before you. The more active you become inside the con, the more fun you can have. For me, I think it's more social. Mainly for me, it's just a lot of close friends that I get to meet once a year because of the diversity of where they all live in the United States. So this is kind of like a meeting point. Go out there, be social, just run into people and say hi, and just strike up conversation because you will meet interesting people here. It's fantastic. Everybody's friendly. I can sit down, talk to anybody, and I just ask them, what do you do? and they're happy to tell me about what kind of employment they do or the hobbies that they're in and just striking up conversations. That's my personal favorite. It's a combination of the people who I run into at DEF CON and just sort of the atmosphere. It's, it's, it's like a giant party that doesn't want to end, but there's a lot of really smart people in one place and it's just, there's really no other place like it.
The first qualification, if you will, to be a vendor at DEF CON is how are you providing back to the hacker community at large? A lot of money goes through there. It, it, it's kind of staggering. One thing that we try and do is most of these guys, most of the vendors, if you walk around that room, this isn't their primary business. These are people that are in the community. You'll take a look at these guys. They're only doing this this time of year and it's only to provide something to the community that they think is neat. Those kind of folks definitely get a priority when I'm when I'm looking through applications. Well, looks like you're doing things right. Okay, is this on? Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. So, what I've tried to do with the whole hacking community is raise the level of discourse. Like, um, that's the thing is like to bring information, make it accessible and widely dispersed at a reasonable price and make people happy. And, and if I put a smile on a face, it's like, wow, really? That's a great price and I get that too? Yeah, that's good. I don't need every last dollar. You know, what are you going to do with dollars anyway? They're just numbers. Uh, our main job actually is to create mayhem. Uh, that's actually what we've been asked by the management to make sure that we create a lot of mayhem. We actually have official DEF CON 8 posters from years ago that we found. So we're not they're, we're not selling them, we're giving them away, but you have to convince us to give you one. And that requires mayhem in the dealer's room of some sort that we don't officially uh, support, but for some reason they end up with a poster. Who knew, right? We are simplewifi.com. Uh, we are long range wireless made easy. We custom make all of our antennas in Miami, Florida. So if you wanna go creating a hotspot and turning around your whole neighborhood or you have that guy with a, unfortunately has an open signal, you wanna pay for Wi-Fi, you can send your antenna pointing right at it, grab that signal and you have internet for free. The people that, that want something one year that you didn't bring invariably won't want it next year. It's like, you know, everyone wanted network cables or everyone wanted pin card readers or uh, prox card readers or uh, mag stripe reader and encoder decoders. Uh, you know, it just, it varies every year. Um, and then, you know, everyone that like leaves, uh, leaves something behind, like we need a hub. And it's like, okay. I only have 53 tables total that, that could be sold. Some vendors are getting two, some vendors are getting three. So you have to decide what's going to actually provide the most benefit to the attendees. What are they actually gonna to wanna to buy? And we, we certainly have made mistakes in the past. For one thing, I, I, I mean, used to, it, we shouldn't have even called it the vendor area. There were a couple of years, and I can't blame anybody but myself for this, where it should have been called the buy your t-shirts room. The only thing that was for sale in there was t-shirts. You know, you had like two hardware vendors and 33 t-shirt vendors. Um, hackers love their t-shirts. I, I think, I mean, in a weird way, it's like a way to kind of express your identity. I think we all do that through our shirts. It's, it's a way when you're walking down the hall at DEF CON or any other conference or at work or wherever, um, for people to kind of get an idea of who you are. So yeah, I mean, the t-shirt aspect of it is certainly important. But this is one place where I can wear all my t-shirts. And people will know what it is. Yeah, people get it. There's, there's something about that like cinematic hacker that's both goofy and inspiring and uh, like I still play up, there's this mystery around it. Oh, spooky hackers, and there's like this dark side to it. And I think I still play that up in the art that I'm still intrigued. I still don't know all of what's going on. Like I'm a maker, I'm not a hacker. 
So I was a goon the first year, and um, they stuck me in the info booth, and then uh, about halfway through the first day, Russ came over first and said, hey, I want you to draw on my badge. We had great big badges that year that Joe Grand did. And so I drew on it, and then Pyro came over and said, hey, draw on my badge. And then in about 10 minutes, there was this line out the door of people like, draw on my badge. And so Russ came up with the idea, well, if you're gonna draw on the badge, why don't you make them give $5 to EFF for every badge you draw on? And raising money, so like laptop, I charge 20 bucks for EFF, and then it, it ended up with a pile of money for EFF like the first year. And so then the second year, they said, you're not gonna be in the info booth, you're gonna have a booth and sell art and draw on things for people to raise money for EFF, and that's how that took off. So. You have to believe in what you're doing, and you have to believe that whatever you have is the hottest, coolest, newest, best thing. And that if you have any shred of doubt about what you're presenting, or if your heart's not 100% into it, the audience is gonna pick up on that right away and tune out. That's, that's the thing. I think the BS filter here at DEF CON is very, very strong. I think the talks and the speeches are absolutely important because it gives the world an opportunity for a very inexpensive price to be able to go learn from the absolute best in the world in this industry about the absolute bleeding cutting edge of technology. It was between uh, three and four hundred submissions that came in for uh, people that wanted to speak at DEFCON this year. Yeah, it was, it was a rough, rough year just because of the, the number of quality submissions. And there were some that any other year absolutely would have been accepted. But I think because this is the 20th DEFCON and it's because people want to be a part of DEFCON 20, we got so many more submissions and so many more quality submissions. I mean, DEF CON speakers are all different types, especially this year. You have, you know, you, you have generals and you have 15-year-old kids, all of whom have something different to contribute. There's no really one thing that you can say that unites a DEF CON speaker except for their desire to present their ideas to an audience. And we've got a really cool VIP this year. Yep. Really cool. They better show up. <laughs> the big celebrity speaker VIP for this year at DEF CON, the director of the NSA and director of Cyber Command, General Alexander. We've been trying to get somebody from the NSA high level to speak for 10 years. And it just so happens that we finally get somebody and it just happens to be our 20th year anniversary. So the timing just works out really well. And I know people are gonna get all bent and not over it. It's gonna be like the love-hate relationship. They're also gonna really be interested in what he has to say. And at the same time, be really fearful of the, of the NSA. It's a milestone to see someone of his position and level come here and speak about uh, security and hackers and those types of things. Jeff Moss made a valid call and he kind of said, look, you know, we have to interact with these people, you know. We have the technical skills and they're the ones calling the shots, so we, we've got to interact with them and at the end of the day we've got to educate them, you know. Hello DEF CON! Something I try to do with DEF CON is I want to expose you guys from the very first DEF CON to people you don't normally see, like I'm sure you guys just don't hang out and have coffee with the general, and uh, neither do I. So to me, it's really eye-opening to understand you know, the world from their view. Having the NSA here was a, a great unveiling of the support and the, I think a little bit of appreciation by the government towards our community now, and a little bit more understanding of the work we do and the actual end goals that we're trying to accomplish here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
honor to be here. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. You know, one of the things I want to talk about is the freedom domain, the internet, and what we can all do to work on this. And so I've got about six hours of presentation and slides <laughs> that we'll cut down to, to some meaningful time for you. I think it's amazing and DT wouldn't believe you if you could go back in time and tell him 20 years from now you're going to have an NSA general here talking to the group sort of as an ally. Seeing people like General Alexander come down and meet with us hackers, it's just amazing. I, I, I've been in the hacking scene for over 20, what, 25 years now and I remember the days when we were just considered criminals that no one wanted to integrate with. They didn't understand how a hacking ethos could be applied to things that weren't illegal. And now, this completely legitimizes what we're doing. People want to see what we're doing, they want to hear about what we're doing, and they're realizing that we have a role to play in keeping the world's infrastructure safe and keeping the government safe. And that, that's awesome. And there's a lot of things that are going on here. We can sit on the sidelines and let others who don't understand this space tell us what they're going to do, or we can help by educating and informing them on the best strategy forward that benefits all of us and our nation. And that's the real reason that I came here, to solicit your support. But on the other side, we also have super privacy advocates. You know, the EFF is going to be right there next to them, and they're probably in a constant lawsuit with the NSA. You know, so try to represent both sides. I mean, they're the ones that have been out there and helping when people try and do crazy laws it's a, that, you know, they don't really uh, understand the implications of, you know, the EFF will step up and try and, you know, right the ship and make things uh, good for everyone. And we like to support them. And I, what I'm trying to do when I have these speakers is I'm trying to expose the audience to people they wouldn't normally come in contact with. It's not just always fun and games, hacking a system. There's a bigger world out there, and you're playing a part in it, and a very important part. Uh, and if I didn't, I kind of think I'd be doing a disservice. It would be sort of like intentionally, I don't know, not aiming as high. Uh, so if you don't like that speaker, don't go to that talk. And I think when you bring in not only our great talent here, but those of our allies, I think that's absolutely superb. All right, that brings this session to a close, so let's have a round of applause for General Alexander. I think that contest and events is very key because it's one of the things that you find if you go to a lot of different conferences, especially in the security arena, it's very boring. <laughs> um, usually you're sitting around at a bar getting really, really drunk with a bunch of friends and going to a couple talks that you're interested in seeing, but overall it's a lot of looking for something to do. We've just grown to where now I believe that I'm managing about 50 events, uh, 50 events and contests throughout uh, DEF CON 20. It just started out as shenanigans with like drunk people in bathrooms at DEF CON. But people started giving us money, I started telling them to donate to the EFF, and so people told me that I should make it official because it became tradition. <laughs> Um, last year we raised about four grand total for uh, EFF, Hackers for Charity, and other hacker spaces around the country. I've been growing my hair out for two years. It was difficult for the girl because she's about this tall and I'm, she had to stand up on a chair to actually finish it all. This year we have a goal because last year he shook on it. DT will be getting a mohawk this year if he likes it or not. Hold on.
I've been playing Hack Fortress, which is, which is an amazing competition. It's one of the highlights of DEF CON for me. Essentially, we have a team of six game players who play Team Fortress, really how it was meant to be played. You know, Medic, Heavy, and they try and capture points. Um, we as the hacking team, essentially, we're doing hacking challenges, cryptography, uh, forensics, physical challenges, social engineering, information gathering, and, and that gives our team benefits. So it might like the other team on fire, it might make everything our team shoots a critical hit. So it's this really cool combination of both gaming and hacking, which, you know, is awesome. Now you've got you've got an objective here. You've got a three-person team, and you have to infiltrate this office, steal a lot of information, and get back out again in 15 minutes. But it's a penetration and data exfiltration job. So team-based people will penetrate into a virtual office, and we're framing out the walls and everything. You'll have to pick in. Once you're in. A team of people then can try to get documents, which you don't just, you know, unlock a lock. You have to spread them out, legibly photograph them, put them back where you found them. I think we're including now there's a smartphone, like an Android phone, so you have to hold it up just right. Maybe you see the pattern, you swipe it out, and you get some contacts. So I have this computer running Windows 311. So I'm watching people trying to fumble their way through Windows File Manager looking for data, but the, the really key thing is if you can unlock the computer where it's chained up, can you get the whole computer out of the office? And can you do it without powering it off? So we are, we are hot jacking into the wires, splicing in a UPS, using a tool that feds use called a hot plug to transfer the switching of the power on a whim. But a lot of people, Mad Dash, half, uh, half Tiger Team, half Marx Brothers movie, running around this office, getting everything, getting out clean, locking it up after themselves. Yeah, I can see a lot of us who used to be the, the guy who would maybe get drunk and worry about being arrested. Now we all have jobs where we do this professionally and get paid for it. To begin, everyone, we're going to do science over here. We're going to do less science over there. <laughs> These teams are tasked with cooling a beer to exactly 42 degrees, <laughs> which is ridiculous. But <laughs> people came through. People came through in amazing ways that I never expected. This year, I took away all the restrictions about what you can and can't do, and I said you have to get it to exactly 42 degrees. And this last minute entry, Team Ice, not science if I remember the name right, hit it, exactly. And it was a fantastic success in the end. <laughs> this is Shiznes live from DEF CON in the beautiful city of Las Vegas. Behind me you can see the skyline. It's a rooftop! Look, it's a rooftop! <laughs> Over to your right, if, if uh, Dave can get it. There we go, there's the mountains. There's the Alexis Park. <laughs>
park is part of the DEF CON legend. It definitely, um, it's probably the closest thing DEF CON has to a home. I know, I wish it was still at the Lexus Park. There was a long period of time that I associate with Lexus Park. We were there for a long time, about six or seven years. I mean, we had the whole property, you could hang out by the pool. This is some horrible 70s, you know, like apartment building laid out rows and rows of these uh, hotel rooms with pools and grass areas down the middle. It's like multiple pools that we could just party at all night. If you don't know what pool two means, if you don't know what pool three means, you weren't there. I mean, some really ridiculous stuff went on. Uh, pool 2 and Pool 3 were just sort of like these uh, nexuses of activity and energy. You could be guaranteed to find something going on at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., all the way to, you know, the sunrise. And we had folks that were underage, and we had folks that were overage, and everyone was not sober and doing their thing. and. I was told at one point that at the Alexis Park, we did enough business in alcohol sales that equaled about four months of their normal alcohol sales. And you talk about debauchery. The AP was where true debauchery hit DEF CON occurred. And at the time, the hotel owners, they, they were all right. They were all right. They basically, they had the attitude of, you know what, you can trash our hotel if you want. You can pay for it, but you're gonna, you know, but at the end of the day, we'll take your money. They weren't as concerned about the lights around the pool getting destroyed and things of that nature, so it was a little bit easier to deal with you know, destruction in that way. I go to check in, and they hand me a list. With check-in, they're like, okay, let me explain this to you. And it's a list of all of the objects in the room at the Alexis Park with a dollar amount next to it. If you would like to destroy this object in your room, this is how much it will cost you. You could just get insane and you weren't waking anyone up. You didn't have to worry about security coming and telling you to stop doing something because usually you were doing it to somebody who wanted you to. The Alexis Park, we were much more hands-on because they didn't have the security staff that a casino does. So I was arrested at DEF CON in 2002 uh, by the hotel security guards, but I don't know who ordered it. I guess a goon, probably a priest, uh, ordered it. And I ended up in the Alexis Park Jail, which was very roomy. It was kind of a Bacchanalian Mediterranean motif. There were like grape leaves on the walls and things like that. There was no bars or anything like that. And since it was a non-gambling hotel, you could do whatever you want, wherever you wanted, because you didn't have to be an adult. You used to make announcements, Def Con, that uh, so-and-so's parents are looking for their runaway child, uh, you know, who was 17 and was off at the con. It was a different experience. Everybody says, I wish it was the Alexis Park again. Oh, I wish we were back at the Alexis Park. Honestly, I do too. I really like the environment, the pool parties, the open atmosphere. We had the whole hotel. But then everybody forgets that, oh, the lines are ridiculous. Oh, the rooms were overcrowded. Oh, I couldn't do anything. It was awful. There was no room for speaking. I mean, people would make t-shirts about how terrible it was to get into the tent in the parking lot. So it's, it's better. It's more organized. But yeah, it's a little different. Um, I, I, I wouldn't go back. For us to go back there now, we would have to cut this conference by two-thirds. And nostalgically, yes, I look back on that time and it was a great time. But we need a venue of the size of the Rio now to support the size that we've become. But that's probably the time when things seem to settle in that, you know, we've got something going here and it's probably going to continue for a while. Well, that's one of the things. I mean, obviously the Alexis Park is near and dear to a lot of people because this is, uh, you know, how many years have we been away from the Alexis Park? And still, every year, somebody drives over there, walks into the front of the hotel, and steals the giant floor mat in the front and brings it back to Kong. <laughs> A conference badge has three purposes. The first purpose is to show that you've paid for the conference. It's a security token. Number two, it sets the level of your security when you're within the conference. Third, I wanted the badges that I created to be something that helped brought people together. 
I intentionally designed the badges to cause people to have to look at each other and talk to each other. To get to know somebody that they might not otherwise have known. It really is the interaction with the other people at DEF CON that makes DEF CON what it is. It's not the, oh, I have this uber awesome electronic circuit badge that does such and such. It's, it's the people wearing the badge that matter. And I think a lot of people miss that. The years where we've had an electronic badge, people show up wanting to do something with this awesome little piece of tech that they were just uh, given for their, their entry fee. This is, uh, we're helping, this is like an open badge uh, solder session. We're helping people complete adding the uh, connectors to their badges. We're not doing it for them, we're assisting them and letting them do it themselves because that way they learn how to uh, solder. So far, no one's done anything that hasn't been able to be fixed. So it's more of a just learning and uh, community learning project, I guess, of just doing the badges. Yes, first DEF CON, first time soldering. A lot of firsts this weekend. <laughs> I really like to help other people uh, just get better at what they do or to find an inspiration, something they're passionate about. And I like to help them progress along that path. Pretty much 90% of the people here have never soldered in their life. This is their first time. And that's the goal. Let's people introduce people, hey, it's not that scary, it's okay. We're here to guide you and uh, maybe, maybe you'll do it in the future. If not, you know you've done it. So it's one of those skills you'll have. I know a lot of guys who are like collecting badge firmwares and flashing yeah. stuff and have no idea what they're supposed to be solving. Usually the only people who are really getting it are sequestered in their hotel room just going crazy on it. There's some people that counterfeit the badges every year. And we try to make the badges hard to counterfeit. And there's some people that spend a lot of time counterfeiting the badges. And I think that's cool. If you can counterfeit the badge and you can get past the guards repeatedly, good for you. You probably deserve to get in, right? That's what a hacking convention is all about. If you're good enough to fool everybody, you put more energy into hacking that badge than, than we did probably in producing it. So good for you. They had the, um, the smiley face, you know, skull and crossbones, the, the, the basic uh, logo for the con. And I think their first design flaw was same PCB board, different colors. So you had people that went out and spray painted them and things like that. Well, the absolute worst thing to do is to step into the goon sock with your cute little red badge and claim that you're a goon because we all know who we are. And once the door closes, you're ours. And so it was a space where I felt more at home, where I didn't have to explain anything to anybody in any other context I'd ever been in. Uh, real hackers are incredible. They take nothing for granted, and they look at things to see how they can be combined to make something new. And, and hackers really have an interesting, innovative, creative way, the best of them, uh, of looking at all sorts of problems uh, that a normal person wouldn't know how to do. And being fearless in the face of ambiguity, holding multiple representations of reality simultaneously in your mind, even though they may be contradictory and conflicting, and holding them there lightly while you explore which ones are a best fit for now to the sensory data coming into society. So, you know, Feynman, great physicist, he said, the interesting fact is the anomalous fact. Emphasize both fact and anomaly, because it says there's a whole cornerstone here of another way of looking at things that we're missing. Well, that's what hackers are looking for, and that's why I've taken to it so, because the edge where new realities are appearing and normals don't see them at first, but hackers are looking for them. They're kind of the little homo nucleus in, inside the machine. When I come here, I don't have to explain anything to anybody. I don't have to back up and explain my point of view or my point of reference or why I said what I said or what was ironic or, or what was meant straight up because people just kind of get it. And that's a terrific thing.
probably our signature event is capture the flag. When you go to DEF CON and walk through the capture the flag area, you're seeing the, the, some of the best of the best teams that are out there. Where this is really, this is the Wimbledon, this is the place around the world where it all comes together. What strikes me isn't even in the room, it's the fact that there were a couple thousand people competing around the world to get into that room. Some of those guys who travel from like South Korea or the Middle East to do the CTF, they came thousands of miles and are not going to sleep for three days <laughs> to participate in one game at one event that happens once a year. And that's what amazes me. It's about a bunch of different teams getting together uh, on a big network trying to steal each other's stuff, in essence. So. It's worth coming once to see it. Capture the Flag has been there since the beginning and really from a hacker perspective is the type of thing of what you think of, hey, how do I take over this guy's computer? Don't miss at any con where you can sit down on the laptop and make the network work and start breaking things. Cool. Uh, so, Crash and Compile is a programming contest crossed with a drinking game. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, if you're familiar with ACM style programming contests, you're given a challenge, a, a word problem, you know, write a program that takes this kind of input and generates that kind of output, some arbitrary word problem. Um, and you start coding. And you're coding along, you're coding along, and then you say, hey, let's, I think I'm going to test something, and you try to compile it. And it doesn't compile, you take a drink. If it compiles but doesn't run, you take a drink. If it runs but doesn't produce the right output, you take a drink. Okay, you can see how this can degrade very quickly. <laughs> uh, after 45 minutes, any points that are not awarded, or that have not already been awarded to uh, competing teams, gets awarded to Team Distraction. The team with the most points at the end of the night goes home with a black badge. No, Team Distraction is not, does not qualify for a black badge, unfortunately. No, I am part of a Team Distraction, which we try, our, our actual first goal is to make sure that, you know, they get enough water and they don't drink uh, too much, but then, you know, of course we have to distract them from their coding and kind of like mess them up and, you know, just distract them a little. Any other questions? No? Great. Let's go program. to energize the crowd. I got to set the pace, set the tone, and then I have to say something outrageous pretty damn quickly. Got to insult somebody quickly. The show's begun and I'm not really aware of much of anything else for the next couple of hours. I want the audience engaged within 10-15 seconds. I want to have that dialogue. Copyright lawyers mean this.
by IT. Win or lose. What is intellectual property? What is intellectual property is correct. This crowd, you can piss this crowd off very easily. So uh, you get your feedback very, very quickly as to whether you're doing a good job or a bad job. Jeff and I had talked, and he says, I really want to notch up the 20th. I want to go up with the bang, and I want to do all these crazy things. And it was cool. I think that this audience probably 50% bigger than last year. So that would put that crowd, I'm guessing, in the 2,500 range, something like that. But this one was huge. Common experiences at DEF CON include, I don't remember, meaning that if you have a good con, you probably have no recollection of what actually happened. If you've never been, don't base your assumptions off what you've read or heard. At this point especially, DEF CON is something that you just have to experience. DEF CON is not a convention, it's a meta convention. But there's so many smaller events, gatherings, meetups, projects, that it's become a group of other smaller conferences. There are other aspects, other facets of the con that are completely different than what you have heard, thought of, expect, or even dreamt or possible. These people you've known from internet stuff, only if they're that. And you come from a small town, right? You don't know anybody into this weird stuff you're into. And you go to DEF CON and that's where you meet the people, right? And it's beautiful and just hanging out, the conversations. It's the place. DEF CON is the place. Um, so they change periodically, and so the fire marshal you had last year may not be the fire marshal. Oh, I think that's uh, the attorney. Hello? Hey. Okay, we'll let you in. I can think of a couple things he might have done, you know, that, that I wished he hadn't have done. Uh, <laughs> I can think of one. When we started, it was very clear that Jeff was younger 
And uh, he was way smarter than me, but in my opinion, he had no street sense, which essentially just meant that he didn't know what the ramifications could be from a law standpoint on some of the stuff we were dealing with. You know, it's really not property damage stuff. We, you know, that you can do something about, you can liquidate that, you can price it, you can figure it out. I mean, we've had lawsuits, we've dealt with, you know, big major battles. Uh, it was me versus what, eight lawyers from Cisco for about two years. And, you know, it's got these players that can get involved that aren't really attached to DEF CON that can put DEF CON at massive risk for government intervention, heavy duty lawsuit intervention. You know, people want to come to DEF CON, which is fine. That's what DEF CON, Jeff likes it, I think. They come to DEF CON and they're like, hey, man, I want to step on the toes of fill in the blank for Mondo, master, master of the universe, aggressive company. I want to come to DEF CON and uh, piss them off. What do you think? And, uh, you know, it certainly isn't boring when somebody says, yeah, I can, I'm going to shut down, you know, Huge corporation X. So there's like problems the public knows about, and then there's problems that never see the light of day, uh, or hopefully never see the light of day. And uh, so we've had a little bit on both sides. Um, you know, nearly dodged lawsuits, those kinds of things. We had um, one at, uh, at the Alexis Park where there was a federal grand jury we heard about that was investigating DEF CON, and they were asking for all the room reservation and credit card info on everybody who attended DEF CON. And, uh, and luckily, we are cash only, so there's no records to seize from us. So as the organization, we were fine, but the hotel and the vendors in the area, I guess they were getting their uh, records taken, seized, and they're performing some investigation. In the end, nothing came of it. The grand jury, as far as I know, never did anything with it. Um, but that's one of those things where, for years, I was telling people, there's a reason why you don't process credit cards and keep records. And, uh, and after years of doing that, I was vindicated in my paranoia, because that would have been a huge legal battle to deal with all of that, uh, to try to turn it over, not turn it over. Um, so there's battles like that that never see the light of day. And this is the first time I've ever actually talked about it. Describe Jeff Moss. Describe Jeff Moss. Oh. Jeff is a friend. Uh, he's, a, he's an interesting guy. He travels a lot. He's very intelligent. Jeff's awesome. He is legitimately a good person. He's absolutely brilliant. And in my opinion, if we didn't have Jeff, um, this community and this culture would have never grown to what it is. Without Jeff, DEF CON would have never made it this far. Uh, I, I believe that without DEF CON goons, it also would have never made it this far. But Jeff is a glue. You know, he's the glue that brought us this far. Yeah, this grew from a very small conference where the staff was equal to or more than the attendees to a crowd that regularly, we've had to move venues every couple of years because we keep growing so much. Yet that continual continuity and the, the spirit of DEF CON, if you will, is maintained because of Jeff. He's overly concerned about what the DEF CON attendees think about the conference. He wants them to have a good experience. He really does. Jeff cares about DEF CON so much. Um, he's a bit shy, as I'm sure everybody has gotten to figure out over the years. It's difficult to get a hold of him sometimes at DEF CON and difficult to grab him. You know, he's like most hackers. He's not overly social. He's got that quiet side, a little withdrawn. He's only got so much that he's willing to give you. He is a really personal, kind-hearted guy. Uh, he is managing chaos and it is not an easy job and he is a very smart guy and it's a very difficult job and fortunately he's also surrounded himself with people who can help him do that. In the early days there wasn't a formal structure. Kind of in the beginning we all were kind of security goons to a certain extent and whether it was official or unofficial there was a group of people that kind of helped keep control of what was going on and it wasn't really until later years that as the attendance went up that we had to deal with more formal roles 
Rule number four, do listen to the goons. If a red shirt tells you to do something, do it. The goons aren't trying to ruin your fun. They're just trying to make DEF CON an enjoyable experience for everyone. I mean, without the goons, I think there's a lot of things that would just fall apart really fast. And they have in the past. Maybe after DEF CON 9, it was really a rough year. I don't exactly remember why, but we had, we had growth spurts. Where at the Alexis Park, they're physically breaking up fights. They're picking drunks up out of the rose bushes. They're doing CPR on people. The goons at the early Alexis Park days that everybody misses were actually goons. Uh, there have been some serious cardiac events uh, that I participated in, but we have had no deaths. We were really beat up after nine, and we had discussions then as, as you know, should we call it quits at 10? We've had a good run, 10 years, that's, you know, that's substantial. Um, you know, maybe we'll do one more and, and see how we feel. And, uh, you know, we did 10, and 10 turned out to be pretty good, and thankfully we didn't quit. All of the various teams have kind of occurred organically. There's a lot of compartmentalization that I don't think people realize. Everyone has their own responsibilities that they're dealing with. We spent a lot of time uh, over the last year setting up for this uh, convention. It is truly a labor of love. We're all volunteers. We don't do this for glory. We don't do this for anything other than we want you guys to have a good time here. When I'm not at DEF CON, we're talking about DEF CON the entire year. We're planning for DEF CON. We're thinking about DEF CON. We're telling DEF CON stories because we live it. We love it. You don't become a goon, you're born a goon. The joke is that we work for shirts. <laughs> we get a couple of shirts. Uh, to, to go and, and work for you know 12 hour days plus uh, at DEF CON, plus all the volunteer time throughout the rest of the year. A couple of our guys have worn pedometers over the years and the average shift is between 15 and 25 miles. So we tend to, especially newer people, we tell them to wear you know the right footwear, make sure you always have water on you. Um, never walk into a situation where you don't have a plan. Uh, one of the things I like to say is at DEF CON, I live my life in the gutter so you don't have to. But you're right, things that people don't see, that's, that's our DEF CON, that's the security goons DEF CON. I'm, I'm glad to do anything I can for my fellow goons, any time, any day. I was creating a contest that would be something I would want to participate in. I used to say, you know, magic is dead in the world, so I'm going to create some for everybody else. I have to design cryptography and puzzles for an incredibly brilliant audience that is designed to be solved in three days. That's been not too easy, not too hard. So now that became my personal contest. My challenge to myself is how do I continue to entertain some of the smartest people in the world and keep their brains occupied for three days when a lot of them are smarter than I am and can figure this stuff out. This referred to an insane sentence in the program. It's on page 40. On the foot represents the third oval, the third, the third uh, sticker in the uh, in the convention set. And those two things are two markers we had to, we had to write on a piece of paper and give to Lost. Uh, probably one of the biggest compliments I've ever been paid was, and I've heard this a couple of times, are people that say, "I go to DEF CON to compete in your contest," and that's. I mean, that, I don't know what else anyone could say. I'm, I'm very flattered when people say things like, I'm shocked because I'm like, it's just stupid stuff that I think up throughout the year and then I put it together and, and uh, try and make it a coherent, flowing contest to the best of my ability. We're inside the Lockpick Village at uh, DEFCON 20. 
and uh, this is where we teach people how to pick locks for entertainment and sport reasons. Most technical people seem to have a rather strange curiosity about how things work and one of the things that leads us into that is how locks work. We can teach most people within five or ten minutes how to start picking locks and then some of them will stay in here and uh, at the end of the day we throw them out and they say oh I didn't go to the talks I was supposed to be going to because they've been sitting in here making uh, picking locks all day long. Most DEF CON talks uh, start with a, a great deal of alcohol and end with a great deal of alcohol. At least the good ones that I've noticed. The aircraft uh, tracking stuff came out of the, the fact that I bought an app for a couple of bucks that allowed me to, to point my, my cell phone at the uh, contrail information that was uh, for that particular flight was overlaid on the, the camera. As I started digging, I found more and more issues, you know, just out of my own curiosity. I was, you know, how does this work? I found all these issues and it got really scary because I, I speak a lot and I go to uh, a whole bunch of conferences. You know, this stuff can start getting really dangerous. So I was thinking, okay, this, even if I don't have all the answers, I need to get this answer out. Really, I've, I've done enough of these things and know the, the crowd that it I don't get, you know, jitters or nerves or anything like that. It's the sort of thing, I'm just kind of, you know, running through some of the slides and my talk, some of the, the, the jokes I may have constructed for a particular slide or, or a particular moment. But mostly it's just, okay, does my laptop work? You know, are the slides up? Does the projector work? Yep. Okay. All good. Thank you. So, yes, um, generally what I say is that when I get bored, bad things happen. For, you know, at the Las Vegas airport here, you've got a flight landing every 90 seconds. That's an awful lot of metal, money, people moving around. How does this all work? How does this all fit together? You, know, you always hear about air traffic control, but does anybody really know how it works anymore? I think that the audience is looking to learn something new. They're looking for an entertaining discussion on interesting technologies that at the end of the day are kind of important. So increasingly my talks have gone into why is the internet such an insecure place? What do we have to do? Not in theory, not to satisfy academic stuff, but like real world, what do we need to change to make this thing secure? All year, all my best research comes here. All year I work on, you know, what am I gonna bring to DEF CON for the next year? What am I gonna do for this particular event? Because it's where it began for me. 
my career started because I started speaking out here in Vegas and started coming out to DEF CON and showing off these toys. I'll be honest, a lot of my talks have had nothing to do with security. It's just like, yo, look what I can make that thing do. The presentation was just facilitating, you know, uh, a dialogue with this industry because unfortunately when something like, you know, a major vulnerability in air traffic control, there's no phone number to call in for that and say, hey, you know, can we talk about this? Uh, you know, um, that doesn't exist. It was the first time I dealt with something that was, was really serious. The entire talk was theory. I, I had no facilities to actually test anything, you know, on a, in a real world scenario, because obviously I don't want to be just going with a plane while in flight. My talks are stories, and that's the one thing that I advise everyone else giving a speech. You're telling a story to your friends about some cool stuff. I have hundreds of hours of research that I have to tie together into a coherent explanation of the world. I was expecting a response, and oh boy, did I get it. I was talking to people from you know, major airlines, people working for uh, airplane manufacturers, air traffic controllers, trainers. I've got a pocket full of business cards after this that I have to go through. So this was sort of me loudly knocking on the door and saying, you might have a problem here. Let's, let's, let's talk about this. Over the years, uh, uh, I've gotten relatively high profile and uh, uh, I am very happy and honored for all the obligations that come along with uh, uh, being a high profile individual. But uh, I do miss being able to just wander through the crowds and see cool stuff and watch cool talks. You know, I got a lot of stuff I've got to do. There's a lot of obligations. I'm not complaining. This is a tremendous amount of fun that I get to have, you know, build all these crazy toys and fill Penn and Teller and show them off. Um, the best moment for me at DEF CON is always going to be at 4 in the morning when someone's showing off some really silly stunt that they built. And maybe it's good or maybe it's not, but man, they love it and they're enjoying talking about it. The community has matured from DEF CON 4 and 5 dramatically. When I was coming to DEF CON 4 and DEF CON 5 and seeing people in an official capacity, I'm now seeing them bring their children, and in some cases their grandchildren, to DEF CON 20. I say, great, bring your kids to DEF CON, because there's no better community to have your kids around than the people that go to DEF CON. There, there's every opportunity for them to learn something. And as long as you're a good parent, <laughs> as long as you're a good hacker, anything that they see or experience, you can lead them on that path. Yep, so this is plastic. So this is just a long string of plastic, so it goes into this. This thing melts, there's a little heater in here that melts it, and then squirts it out as the machine. Yeah, it's like toothpaste. This is the second time um, for DEF CON Kids and the second time that I've been involved. And uh, DEF CON Kids last year sort of just was a, a smaller um, way to try to get kids and, and their parents involved in, in the hacker community and uh, basically teach kids about lock picking and soldering and hardware hacking and privacy issues and law enforcement issues, just all of these things that kids don't normally learn in school. Speaking at DEF CON Kids and working with these kids is almost more exciting to me, or just as exciting, if not more, uh, than giving a talk at DEF CON. 
and having an opportunity to directly influence these kids. I mean, it's a, like an immediate, you can see in their eyes just this immediate understanding of once you show them something, they get it. And uh, I mean, that could change their life. I would like to start, you know, programming. Like, I would like to start learning the languages uh, that they mention. For example, I'd like to start learning Python. What, we, what we're thinking of doing is adding some little extra pieces onto here and solder those on and make some other cool like programming with the light light and make a cool little light show. The kids love all these speakers and like they're the best speakers and I couldn't believe that DEF CON kids had the same top speakers addressing our children. The people who are, are supportive, helpful and just want the kids to gain this love of what they're passionate about and sharing it with the world and it's it's wonderful. This is kind of like, you know, for the kids, it's really inspired them to get involved in the hacking community and start doing some things. So, you know, we've had the privilege to hear from some really great guys and uh, the kids are excited to go back and start doing things. It's been a lot of fun so far. Even though it's only day, day one and I think we have about four or five hours of sleep, it's been <laughs> awesome. Well, most interested, I think, is hacking. I kind of want to be a hacker when I get older, you know? I, I would definitely call myself a hacker. <laughs> so this is the year that your daughter, your eldest, goes to DEF CON, right? <clears throat> um, I plan on bringing my 14-year-old to CON. Um, this year, hopefully, will be her first year. So I'm hoping to drag her out and show her not just what I have experienced over the years, but frankly, where she came from. Um, because at a basic level, I have to explain to my kids that I met your mom at DEF CON 4. I've asked DT for child support, and he's like, ha 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 ha, who are you? That's how it went, really. I don't expect, you know, Jeff to know who I am. After all of these years, I mean, I've been going to his shows for 16 years. And I, that's okay. I feel okay with him not knowing me personally because frankly, the dude's got like 20,000 people that some of them expect him to know him personally. I'm okay with that. If there's a message you wanted to say to him, what would it be? Thank you, Jeff. I, after Capture the Flag, I thought the scavenger hunt kind of embodied the hacker spirit the most. There's a tinfoil swimsuit. Good job. She's clean. She's clean. They're going to suck my blood. <laughs> We've got a huge list of items and or tasks for the teams to complete. By the end of the day, or the end of the weekend, the team with the most points wins. There's a lot of activity at the tables constantly. Um, because the list is things to get and things to do and things to perform and that sort of thing, we get a lot of... Find, make... Activity eat. all the way around the table. I mean, we want people to have a good time and ending up in jail generally is, doesn't, is, is not a good time. Uh, while there may have been things that were a gray area or could end up being a legal activity, I, I think we come from a, a community who knows not to get caught. We don't condone fire or stealing. Um, <laughs> I don't know how someone sourced it or found it, but the head of a cow. We put on the scavenger hunt list a live chicken, and I think we got six or something. Scavenger hunt winners of the past go on to become goons and contest creators and contest organizers and speakers and staff 
because you have so much social interaction, it really ingrains you into, into the community. Oh, on the weekend at DEF CON, uh, I think last year we booked 14 shows. I issued the ultimatum, I'm going to book less shows, and it ends up being more. about DEF CON that I find incredibly fascinating is that yeah a lot of these basement dwelling like you know guys are just like basically getting tan off of a LCD monitor party the hardest out of anybody I've ever met like uh, serious rock stars here that everybody just fueled by alcohol and balls and uh, you know any type of uh, ADHD medication they get their hands on so Okay, so we're going to kick this thing off. Um, we've got really a lot of things to talk about, but we've tried to organize it. So, this is the 20th year. How many people believe that? Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just curious by a show of hands, how many people was this your first DEF CON? So we've scared away everybody else. <laughs> We've got guys that have been helping out for 19 years, and that's amazing. I would just would never have expected that. So I guess I'm most proud of producing something, having a group of people support me that's still doing stuff that people care about. So 
What I want to do is we want to hand it over to Zach Franken, who's been the head of operations for, I don't know, closer to 18 years. Let's hear a round of applause. Thanks. Thank you, DEFCON 20. DEFCON, as Jeff's already said, couldn't exist with a lot of effort from a lot of people. And in the early years, I used to name them all, but now there's 300 of them. I've trimmed it slightly. So, while well, DEFCON is running, basically, I'm almost certainly not having a good time. <laughs> uh, mainly because I just run around and put out fires. And of course, my friend Jeff, who threw this shindig 20 years ago. I can't believe it's still fucking going, but it is. I can't believe there's so many people here that had a great time. And most of all, thanks to you. It's you guys that make DEF CON. Thank you so much. DEF CON is not something that happens for us for three days in July or August every year. It's almost something that we think about and work on and do stuff for all year round. It, it becomes almost a part of your identity and I know it sounds kind of weird. It's when, every, when everything comes together, I know why I stayed up all night, so many nights in a row, you know. There have been moments where you sit back and it's also part of the reward. You sit back and say, that is just absolutely amazing that someone was able to think of that or several someone was able to think about that and do that. I still love just how excited people are there and the fact that you helped to make it happen for them. Thank you, Deviant. It was a really great challenge. It was fun to compete and DEF CON was great. Thank you, everybody. This community is misunderstood by the media and unfortunately the media is the message out to the non-geek, non-hacker community. But the thing that I think came out perhaps this year more than any other year. So I just want to tell you what we've been doing for the last three years. Uh, year one we had 95 people sign up for Be The Match Bone Marrow Donor Registry. Year two was 161 and this year we got 232 people to sign up. In addition to, th in addition to that, we raised over $3,300 as well. More than any other year, this one was really about love. With the blood raising, uh, the cancer stuff, the, uh, the huge amount of money for EFF. I mean, it, even just saying it and thinking, it gives me kind of goosebumps. It, it, this one was 20 years of love. Okay, we got some uh, some numbers for you. The info booth raised fifty-eight dollars. The uh, firearm simulator, thirty-six hundred and twenty dollars. Mohawks, four thousand three hundred thirty-three. Eddie Mears with the artist with his great T-shirts, which you can still get outside the contest area, thirty-five hundred dollars. The summit, fifteen hundred seven hundred eighty-nine dollars. Fifteen thousand. $15,789. And a Hacker Jeopardy for a total of $30,380. So thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> so I'm gonna go over here. So you have to understand, he's made this promise for what, three years in a row now? This is beautiful. We've been waiting for this. Time for Jeff to get his hawk. Now, Jeff failed to mention that he has like six different meetings with incredibly important people around the world in the next couple of weeks. 
You know, it's actually really nice fulfilling a promise. Because <laughs> now they can't bug me. <laughs> true. That's true. Now, but I haven't decided. Don't I have to donate money to the EFF for this? Of course. I was, um, I was thinking maybe $10,000. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think? That's probably a pretty good thing. <laughs> Thank you very much. See you next year. Woo! I joke, I joke with Jeff that he could cancel it tomorrow, like legitimately cancel it, say, screw it, I'm done, I'm gonna go do something else with my time. And DEF CON would still happen. It would continue to happen. Everybody would just go to Vegas anyways. Eventually people would start talking about stuff. Eventually they'd say, let's go out of the bar and go take over this empty conference room and talk about it. And DEF CON would continue to happen organically, probably for years after we just walked away from it. So for those of you who aren't in the conference business, what happens is you sign hotel contracts for years in the future. You have to look into the future and decide, okay, two years from now, are we going to be burned out? Are people even going to want to come to DEF CON two years in the future, three years in the future? Because you, you have to sign these hotel contracts years in advance. And so who could you hand this off to? Or who would want to take on that responsibility? And I think the conclusion I've come to is I'd probably just stop. You know, and I'd, people could continue, the organization continued, they'd just name it something different. I'd give them all my projectors, you know, I, it would carry on maybe under a different name. But it probably wouldn't carry on under the DEF CON name. The only scenario I figured that out was if I get hit by a bus and I die, I want to have the final DEF CON as a huge party. And though somebody would have to plan that because I wouldn't be around. I don't know why, every year, honestly, every year after DEF CON, I think half the senior staff says never again. All of us, we're all, yeah, me too, me too. Uh, and, and then all your friends, I have friends all over the world that DEF CON for sure they show up to. And you get wound up, you get excited for it. You, 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 you look forward to the experience again. So, yeah, we forget how much it hurt. Yeah, I do it. I have been. I've been doing it for a long time. You know, my second, she's 10 years younger than I am. She's been doing it for five years. She's probably due for her shot to, to do it. And I can be the old gray beard that shows up at DEF CON and just sits in the corner, has a beard and reminisces. I can honestly say that without that first DEF CON and without, you know, shaking hands and meeting people, becoming a goon, uh, I wouldn't be in the position that I'm in now and I wouldn't have the career and the means to support my family that I do now. I, it's outside of my imagination missing a DEF CON. When I started, it was like, oh my God, I found my home. And that was, that's kind of where it started for me. Once, once I got to the first one, uh, I was hooked from that point on. It's a degenerate family reunion. These people are my family. It's a family reunion. You gotta come every year and see everyone. Uh, it basically, if you go once, you're hooked. DEF CON is, uh, it's an experience like nothing else. It's great people and a great atmosphere. And I think um, from the time that I went, I knew that I would always go, that I would find a way to make sure that I was there every year. Um, and 13 years later, I'm still going. Uh, these people aren't just my friends. It's, uh, they're my family, you know, and I genuinely, genuinely love them.
Uh, I don't believe it's appropriate to talk about that on camera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't discuss that. I'll tell the story, but I, I don't think we should put it actually in the, in the movie. Let's get, let's get that yeah. No, no naming names. No naming but, names. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll tell you off camera. <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Edit that out. <laughs> Uh, nothing that I'm going to admit on camera at this time and until the statutes of limitations run out. And then uh, happy to admit it later on that once we've you know checked with the lawyers and all that stuff. Yeah. I think half of the experiences of my life that I could attribute that to happened at a DEF CON. I don't know how many of them I can talk about. I probably can't talk about any. I really would like to, but 